Buonasera amiche e amici di NBA Fashion, quest'oggi siamo in compagnia di Ralph Marchetta, ex manager dei Phoenix Suns. Buonasera Ralph. Buonasera. Buonasera. Yeah, I've worked for the Phoenix Suns for 32 years. Yeah. Um, I managed the arena, um, I worked for the team. Um, I really, I was involved in all aspects of the facility um, and working with the NBA for the schedules. Um, we hosted the NBA All-Star Game, the WNBA All-Star Game. We hosted the NBA Finals uh, twice during my career. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was it was a great uh, a great ride. It was a, a wonderful career. Yeah, absolutely yes. And come è nata la sua vocazione all'interno proprio di questo questo mondo e questa volontà di lavorare proprio nel mondo dell'NBA e del basket? Ah, I I think I I really when I was young, yeah. I watched the NBA, I watched um, the players Um, when my father took me to Phoenix Suns games when I was young and, and that I think started for me the passion of, of uh, the sport. And then as I started to work uh, for the Suns, you know, in the arena and got to meet the players and, and have much more interaction, um, it really became more and more exciting for me to be around this. Lei ha conosciuto qualche giocatore che vedeva in televisione anni e anni prima, anche quando ha iniziato a lavorare. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, would, I would see, um, you know, players that I had watched on TV or that, uh, that you know, I grew up uh, idolizing. Yeah. And then I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to work around them. And it was interesting, you know, 30 years ago, it was, it was much different. And, you know, the, we were able to interact more with the players than uh, we, would, we would see them every day. Uh, and now it's a little, a little bit different. You know, there's uh, the Phoenix Suns built a $40 million dollar training facility uh, that's separate from the, from the arena. Um, so, you know, the players, uh, uh, we, we don't see them as much as we did then, but it's, it's still exciting. Yeah. Um, qual è stato il cambiamento nel corso degli anni, di questi 30 anni, di questa carriera mm. trentennale? della sua figura all'interno proprio della società e anche dell'NBA stessa? Cioè, come è cambiato nel corso di questi anni? A lot. <laughs> Many things have changed. Um, it is, I think if, in different areas, if I think back 30 years ago, um, the presentation of the games was very basic. Mm. Uh, and now, it is much more of an entertainment experience and it's uh, non-stop action. Even when the game, you know, even when they're not playing, it's still always entertainment, always something happening in the arena. And then I think the league, now there are many more European players that are playing, which just in the last, even in the last 10 years to see how many more European players are playing. And so I think the sport has become, the NBA has become much more international, which is a good thing. And, you know, you see teams that are going to, uh, that play games, NBA teams that play games in Europe every year, play, game, play games in Mexico every year. Um, The Phoenix Suns are going to play in China, um, you know, in, in Macau. So you've got teams going to Asia, playing in China, playing in Japan. So it's, it's become much more global in the last 10 or 15 years. 
proprio nel corso di questi anni, secondo lei, qual è stata la miglior stagione dei Phoenix Suns? Wow. The best. Ah, I think when we went to the NBA Finals in 1993, okay. that was definitely one of the great seasons that I remember because uh, Charles Barkley, Michael Jordan, you know, you had that, that Bulls dynasty in the early 90s uh, for the Phoenix Suns. Um, we, you know, we had brought Charles Barkley on uh, that season. Uh, the, the arena opened, brand new arena, America West Arena at the time opened. And we beat the Los Angeles Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. And it was, it was amazing. And, you know, we, we ended up losing the finals to the Bulls. Um, but it was, it was spectacular. And we actually, we had a parade uh, after the NBA finals in Phoenix. So downtown Phoenix, a parade with all the players. And we lost. We didn't win. <laughs> and you know, hundreds of thousands of people came uh, to support the team and, 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 and express, you know, how, how much the team meant to them in that season and to go to the final. So that, that for me is one of the, one of my best memories. Um, and there have been some, it, it's been interesting. The year we went to the NBA finals too, recently when we played Milwaukee, yeah. played the Bucks, that was coming out of COVID. And, and I remember that year, we, the NBA season was 2020, and the NBA season started in December. And we had gone through major renovation of the arena, but there were no concerts, no basketball games, no events, right, in 2020. And then the NBA season started, but with no fans. So in December, you know, I, I could walk around the arena during a Suns game and there was nobody there. It was a very strange feeling, but that, that season too, going to the NBA finals was, was amazing. But I think, and with Steve Nash, uh, you know, a lot of those, those seasons, Um, we've just had some great teams over the years and some great players. It's been, it's been really exciting. Ha parlato di diversi giocatori, ora di Steve Nash, ha parlato di Charles Barkley. Secondo lei, qual è il miglior giocatore della storia di Phoenix Suns? Qual è stato? Wow. I mean, I think Charles Barkley will always have, um, a very special place in the heart of the fans. Um, he connected with the fans in, in a way that not all players can or do. Um, you know, he, he is bigger than life, Charles. It is still bigger than life. And so I think, um, You know, he, he, will, he will always have a very special connection. But I, I think over the years, too, like Steve Nash, Amari Stoudemire, um, you know, it, it, Kevin Johnson, um, Mark West, um, you know, just great players over the years and, and very, very special teams, too. Parlando sempre di giocatori, poi ci spostiamo, andiamo al lato Lakers, un giocatore che ha fatto la storia dei Los Angeles Lakers, <ride> Kobe Bryant di Kobe. <ride> yeah. Ok, secondo lei come ha cambiato il mondo del basket Kobe e che eredità ha lasciato ai posteri? Uh, well, I, I mean, he was, uh, he was such a, an amazing talent. And Phoenix and Los Angeles always and continue to have an incredible rivalry in all sports, um, but in, in particular basketball. And so Kobe for, I think Phoenix Suns fans was uh, this, you know, this, 
I think everyone, everyone always respected his incredible talent, his incredible ability. What? And he was <laughs> such a gifted player. <laughs> but, but there was always that, you know, that, that, uh, uh, you know, we always wanted to beat them and we always wanted to beat him. And, but watching him and especially, you know, in the days when Shaq was on the Lakers and, you know, they were, they were, um, they were so strong and, and dominated for, you know, for so long. And he, uh, you know, and I think it was interesting, like any time we played the Lakers, it was an automatic sellout, you mm -hmm. know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, people wanted to see Kobe play. And it, it reminds me of like when Michael Jordan played, you know, and we played the Bulls, people wanted to see him play. And so with Kobe, it was very much the same way. People wanted to be able to say, I saw Kobe Bryant play. Mi ho parlato di Kobe, di tanti giocatori. Penso quest'oggi a Wem Banyama, giocatore francese, yeah. un fenomeno assoluto. Uh, secondo lei, dal punto di vista mediatico, quanto è stato importante il suo impatto e se può essere paragonato in un certo senso a quello di LeBron James? Wow. Ah, I mean... Time will tell, right? We'll, we'll see what kind of an impact he has. But, you know, based on his talent and ability and what he's demonstrated so far, you know, he's, he's going to have, I think, an incredible career. And again, it's that, that international, um, you know, that international component of the NBA too, which makes it an even even bigger story and even better story and watching the olympics you know when you watch that final that MB, or the the olympic the gold medal uh, yeah. game in the olympics you know and you see all of the players that played for france and you know and the other the other teams um, and and you know all of the nba players that were part of that it's it's incredible you see that excitement and and expectation um, and i think he will, uh, you know, I think he'll prove to be a great player, in my opinion. Questa presenza costante ogni anno di giocatori europei ha fatto assottigliare un po' il gap tra il basket europeo e quello statunitense, mm -hmm. secondo lei? E cosa pensa degli italiani presenti mm -hmm. in NBA? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that gap is closed. I mean, mm -hmm. I think if you look at you know, the talent that is coming from Europe um, and the number of players that are coming from Europe. Uh, just again, in the last 10 years, you see that that, um, you know, that talent is there and that ability is there. And, and it's the, uh, the American players, I think because of the university system and they come out of the colleges and, you know, it's, it's a little, um, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, but you've seen that, um, uh, you know, because of the increasing popularity of basketball in Europe, you, you've seen that, that, you know, that gap is closed for sure. I think we're going to see more Italian players, uh, that, that will play in the NBA. Um, again, because that talent is there and that the, uh, the ability is there. And so, uh, Gallinari is a great example and, and, and there are going to be, you know, there are going to be others that will, uh, that will be able to make the, make the move. And I think the NBA is more open to talent, talent, international talent than, than maybe it was at one point. So now it's, you know, players in Italy, I think will have a better opportunity uh, to make, make the move to the NBA. That would be my guess. Arriviamo ai giorni d'oggi. Ora che ha lasciato questo suo ruolo, questa sua occupazione, cosa farete in futuro e quali sono appunto i progetti di Ralph Marchetta? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, uh, so I worked uh, for the Suns for 32 years mm. and I managed the arena, I managed the the facilities and and was involved on the on the um you know kind of all aspects of that 
and I was, I was ready to do something a little bit different. And now I'm going to be more focused. I still love the sports side. I still love basketball. I still am a fan. I will always be a fan. Um, mm. But now I'm, I'm doing um, something a little bit different. So more on the music side uh, for concerts. Um, and, and so that part of it, I, I enjoy also. But I will always be a fan for sure. <laughs> Amici e amiche di MB Fashion, eccoci tornati sempre con Alfa Marchetta. Siamo qui uh, in diretta, continuiamo questa intervista. La prima parte fatta dal mio collega Elio Granito. Adesso è qui la vostra caporedattrice che vi parla. Qui andiamo su un lato un po' più tecnico della pallacanestro, quindi parliamo proprio di Phoenix Suns, entriamo davvero nel vivo. Vorrei sapere che cosa è cambiato con il passaggio di proprietà da Robert Server a Matisbia e perché ha comprato i Suns, sappiamo, e le Mercury, quindi sia la uh, squadra NBA che WNBA, per una cifra record, quindi 4 miliardi di dollari, ormai sì. due anni fa. Quindi questo passaggio che cosa ha comportato? Ah, uh, so, it was a, uh, for me, and, and having lived through it, it was really a difficult time, because there was a NBA investigation, And then uh, Robert Sarver sold the team uh, and there was the transition to, to Matt Ishbia. Um, and I think, you know, I th think what um, Matt has done is been amazing in terms of the resources he's brought. Um, he built a, um, you know, a hundred million dollar uh, complex for the offices and for the Mercury training facility. He's spending the money on the players. So he's, he's, he's brought a lot of resources to, uh, to the team. And so that I think has been, uh, has been good. Um, but it's, it's always interesting. This was my third ownership transition. So okay. Jerry Colangelo was the owner that I, I worked for first and then Robert Sarver. Uh, and, then, uh, the, and then Matt Ishbia. Ok. Vorrei sapere, parlando appunto sempre della dirigenza, chi è la figura all'interno della società più influente e che quindi ha dato ai Phoenix Suns la forma che hanno oggi? Quindi chi ha reso ai Phoenix Suns la squadra che sono oggi, in questi 32 anni della tua carriera? That's a really good question. Um, I think... You know, for, for me, I think there have been a few people uh, over my career that were, were really very influential within the organization. Jerry Colangelo, first and foremost, certainly. Um, and people that were uh, helpful to me and mentored me along the way. Um, Al McCoy, who recently passed away, he was the broadcaster for the Phoenix Suns for 52 years, I think, 51 or 52 years. Um, you know, Mike D'Antoni, um, Paul Westfall. Um, yeah, it's, it's a long list. I mean, very, uh, but, but Jerry Colangelo, I think, primarily because he, uh, really transform the Phoenix Suns. When Jerry Colangelo bought the, bought the team, uh, he, he transformed the, the, the squad and, and built the arena and brought Charles Barkley in and you know, did so much um, in Phoenix. So he, he would probably be the top of the list, but that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> It is. Nel 2007 Mike D'Antoni era l'allenatore dei Phoenix Suns, mm. ma sappiamo che fu licenziato. Quali sono stati i motivi che hanno portato a, a questo cambiamento in panchina? I would, I, that's a hard question because, and I think, I think with any of, uh, any of the coaches, um, it, there are, uh, I guess there's a saying, you know, coaches are hired to be fired. I mean, it's, it's just, it's kind of the nature of the job. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, different coaches kind of run their course. And 
it's, you know, chemistry with players. There are, um, a big part of it can be the relationship with the owners. You know, if, if the owner loses trust, uh, in a coach, um, but Mike D'Antoni was a, was a great coach for the Phoenix Suns. He was, okay. he was amazing. Uh, I could ask the same question with uh, for Frank Vogel, which was fired uh, uh, more recently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think part of the diff... I think this is just what, what I've seen, is that um, the, you know, coaches... The players are have a much bigger voice in terms of the coach's coaching decision, right? Or the the decision of who will be the coach or if the coach. The players, I think, now more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, certainly. Um, at least it, it seems to me that they are uh, more vocal. And I think, um, you know, if... If a coach, uh, you know, kind of loses the uh, the players and and the owner, it's it's a very difficult situation. Okay. Yeah. Mike Badenholder signed uh, with the Phoenix Suns uh, recently a contract for fifty million fifty million dollars in five years, and. Uh, um, if, if you can tell us, <laughs> we would know why he's the right man for the Phoenix Suns right now. Well, I can't, yeah, I can't speak to that now, but, I, you know, it, certainly um, he, uh, you know, now outside looking in, um, you know, it seems like he's got, um, you know, the right um, personality to, in, to work with the players. Uh, he's been obviously very successful. Um, he actually has Arizona roots. So I think he's got, you know, certainly ties uh, to the community. And, um, you know, he's demonstrated success at a high level and he has the, um, you know, certainly the uh, uh, confidence, I think, of the fans uh, and the players and the ownership and so all of those things certainly would indicate that he's the perfect you know the perfect perfect person at this point okay um, I want to know something about this Steve Nash Steve Nash has always been a really good player and I think it was really important for the Phoenix Suns but I want to know why he Never won uh, a ring with Nick Suns. Well, what, yeah, uh, and, and <laughs> what the problem? What, uh, you know, uh, Steve Nash, uh, Hall of Fame player, Charles Barkley. I mean, other Hall of Fame players. Um, yeah, it's it makes me sad because <laughs> I, you know, both Steve Nash and Charles Barkley to me deserved to, to win, uh, certainly to win a ring, but. You know, it's, it's, I think, uh, you know, look, I, for me, looking back as a fan, right, it, it was, um, you, you would see uh, the chemistry and what a great team we had. And sometimes, you know, things just don't go your way. And, and, and I think that happened to us in a couple situations, right? And, yeah, that Steve Nash not having a ring, Charles Barkley not having a ring, a lot of those great players uh, for the Phoenix Suns that didn't get rings. It, it's sad. It's unfortunate. Yeah, it yeah. is sad. I they, know. Had, they had great careers, um, you know, great careers no matter what, um, but but didn't didn't get that you know that champion. It's not a ring that makes a player a good player. I, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's true. Yeah. Allen Iverson doesn't have a ring, That's right. but he's a really good player. Great player, yeah. Uh, let's talk about Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant arrived at Phoenix Suns recently for a, a $54 million contract in uh, uh, three years, I think so. Uh -huh. And I want to know what did the team needed need for uh, choose Kevin Durant? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think he's, he brings leadership and scoring and, you know, talent at a high level. And, and so, um, you know, when 
James Jones and and Matt Ishbia and you know they they made that decision to bring Kevin Durant and that was a really a transformative move right and if you remember that happened the first uh, week that Matt Ishbia owned the team they made the move you know we made the move for Kevin Durant mm -hmm. so it was it was a uh, I think it was a big statement you know by ownership to say. You know, we're serious. We want to win now. Okay. I think that was, yeah. Okay, uh, Devin Booker. I want to ask something about Devin Booker. Yeah. He got injured many times in his career, yeah. but he's really young. So yeah. I want to know if uh, you think that injuries are a problem or he can return. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I think he's he's going to have, he'll have a long career. And, and okay. you know, Having watched him since he came to Phoenix has been amazing. And to see how he's developed, uh, you know, from a great player at Kentucky to really a legitimate NBA superstar, right? Mm -hmm. And and he's he's amazing to watch. And I think, you know, and, that, and I guess that's another thing too. Um, we talked a little bit about how things have evolved over the years. Uh, the um, quality of the trainers and the training and, you know, sports medicine, the way it's evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. You see players able to have much longer careers. You look at LeBron now, you know, and, and how long Steve Nash played. And, and so I think, you know, for Devin Booker, um, you know, he's... Certainly, he'll have a he'll have a long career. Okay. Hopefully, in Phoenix too, like the whole time. <laughs> so you know, we hope. The DeAndre Eaton was the first pick of yeah. the Phoenix Suns yeah. in NBA draft 2018, but then he went to the Portland Trail Blazers. Yeah. Years. Yeah. What were the problems behind the, the separation of the Phoenix Suns and the DeAndre Eaton? Well, I think you know from from what I saw, I think um, you know it, it was DeAndre Ayton was the number one pick for the Suns that year. He um, he went to the University of Arizona. He was an incredible college player, um, and I think the you know the the thought was that he would make that transition to the NBA. And, and, you know, as, as well, and he has, but I think it just, he didn't, um, ultimately, I think with the players and again, chemistry is a very difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is he going to be, have a better situation in Portland? Time will tell. Right. But I think, I think, you know, certainly in Phoenix, it, it, it kind of felt like, um, you know, he wasn't happy and, 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 you know, the issues around with, with, I think, you know, the coaches and, and just, and, and, and some of the other players, it just didn't seem like that, that chemistry was, was gelling. And so, you know, at that point, and you see it all the time, right. In, in any sport where a, a player might have, you know, the skill and the ability, but if that, if there isn't that cohesion, because it is a team sport, if there isn't the cohesion and and the chemistry, it doesn't work. And then I think you know moves, then moves are made that are in the best interest of the of the team, and and ultimately end up being in the best interest of the player too, because hopefully they end up in a better situation. Okay. Considering the changes of uh, the last years. Who is right now the most important player of the Phoenix Suns? I mean, you know, I think uh, certainly Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and Bradley Beal are kind of the big three, right? Ah, okay. In terms of the in terms of the Suns, but uh, yeah, I, I look at like um, as at those three as as kind of the you know the cornerstones of the team. But okay. Devin and Devin will, I think, you know, and hope that Devin Booker will be. Um, will be that, uh, you know, that, that huge part of the team for years to come, right? Okay. And, yeah.
Mm, the WNBA is an increasing league. Yeah. And uh, right now, with the uh, first season of Caitlin Clark, uh, yeah. the, the increasing is much more than the last year's. Amazing. And I want to know, um, who, what do you think about the gap between female and male sports? And uh, um, if you think that the gap, um, thanks to Caitlin Clark, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is um, less than the last year's between the NBA and WNBA? Well, I think, um, you know, having watched uh, for 20 years now, um, it's amazing to see where the WNBA is. And uh, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, I mean, they've been transformative players this season, but it's bigger than, than the WNBA. It's women's sports in general. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at, particularly in the United States now, the um, the demand for women's sports is incredible. Um, I mean, and, and we, uh, this this past Mercury season, when I was still around, um, <laughs> you know, it was amazing because, uh, you know, ordinarily a Mercury game, you know, on a good night would do, we would have, you know, maybe eight, 9,000 people in the building, in the arena. We had Caitlin Clark completely sold out. 17,000. Wow. Packed. <laughs> packed. And she's, wow. and she's doing that everywhere she goes. And, yeah. and the TV numbers are big. Um, and so she's been, you know, transformative, I think, in, in terms of the WNBA. But it's, again, to me, I, I think it's bigger than that. I think it's women's sports in general, women's soccer, mm -hmm. uh, the National right. Women's Soccer League in the United States. So that that has really exploded and 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 taken off. Uh, so it's 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 awesome. It's great to see. It's very exciting. What are the difference in the differences between the um, between leading a male Society and yeah. female society between the Suns and the Mercury. You know, I, I think, um, I think the games are a little bit different, right? Like you know, people that are basketball purist really like the WNBA because it's very much about you know, you know, shooting and and plays and and it's. Um, and, and the NBA is, the WNBA, at least to me, seems more, um, more team oriented. And the NBA at times can seem a little bit more star oriented. Um, so I think it's, um, you know, it, it, it's a different, it's a, it's a different game, but it's equally as exciting. It's equally as um, interesting and fast paced. And, um, I think, you know, a lot of the thing, the, the same principles apply to both, right. In terms of how coaches and, and players interact and, and how it all comes together. Okay. Last question. Uh, I want to talk about Brittany, Brittany Griner. She was arrested and she stayed in a Russian prison yeah. for a lot of months. Yeah. And I want to know if uh, it was difficult to uh, handle with uh, her missing the, the team for one season. I wasn't involved in, in you know, any of that, but like, it was being part of the organization at the time and mm -hmm. watching um, how the organization uh, was so focused on doing everything possible uh, to get her back, mm -hmm. to get her out of Russia. It was, it was, um, it was amazing. And I think, yeah, in, in the players, you know, it was, it became a very emotional season because she wasn't there. And I think, uh, yeah, I think it was really, it was really tough. And, um, I just remember how, you know, every week there was, there were, you know, updates and how the team was working with the U S government and the state department. And, 
you know, all of these different entities to do anything possible to get her out and, and how, um, her family and, and the team and how really in the community, uh, rallied around her and, and how much support she had and, and how happy people were when she, she was able to come home.